Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Glad that you're here this morning. For those of you in person, welcome. And for those of you online, welcome. I'm glad that you're tuning in and watching us and joining us. Um, you know, the, the neat thing about being here is, is that we get to kind of figure out again that we're not in control and there's, there's not a whole lot that we can do. We can pray and we can trust in the Lord. But I know about you, but when I look at all that's going on in the world, it's hard to think that I can really make a difference. But we know that God can. And today is a great day to help us remind us that God is in control and God has got this thing. Uh, and to help us reorient our minds and hearts around that idea, we start off with some songs. Then we have a prayer. Pastor Dave is going to lead us in prayer this morning. Then we're going to read God's word together. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then Pastor Tim is going to talk to us this morning from the book of Exodus. And then we're going to look to carry on this conversation that we have this morning with those around us that so desperately need to hear the truth. Uh, just a reminder that the baskets are in the back for your love offering and tithes, as well as you can give uh, through the website or through the Uversion app. So please uh, take advantage of one of those options. And our worship team this morning is ready to lead us. So let's lift up our hearts and voices in adoration of him. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Tim. Good morning, everyone. The Lord is good. Amen? Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 99. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Please stand with us as we sing, Love the Lord. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength.
with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. I will love you, Lord, with all my heart. First John 5, 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is this that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Suffered 
testimony everyone overcome we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him.
cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Jesus for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast your love ran red
Please be seated. Praise the Lord. On uh, Tuesday of this past week, dear friend Jean DeVos went to be with the Lord and joined Brad, her husband, around the throne of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Uh, she was a special lady who blessed our church family for many years with uh, grace and uh, who loved the Lord Jesus deeply. Uh, she is missed. Uh, keep her family, extended family, in prayer as they go through uh, this time of loss. Uh, just a reminder as well, on Friday of this week, uh, there's no school, um, but there is a corn maze uh, up in Pennsylvania, and there's details of that in the bulletin, and if you're, you're invited to be a part of that, as is our school itself. Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning, shall we? Oh God, you are very, very great, and our lot is to approach you with godly fear and humble confidence, for your condescension equals your grandeur, and your goodness is your glory. We are unworthy, but even as we sang, you welcome us. We are guilty, but you are merciful. We are poor and needy, but your riches are unsearchable. You have shown boundless compassion towards us by not sparing your son and by giving us freely all things in him. This is the foundation of our hope, the refuge of our safety the new and living way to you, the means of that conviction of sin, brokenness of heart, self-despair, which will endear us the gospel. Happy, happy are they who are Christ, in him, at peace with you, justified from all things, delivered from coming wrath, and made heirs of future glory. Give us such deadness to the world and such love to the Savior, such attachment to the his house of worship, such devotedness to his service as proves us as recipients of his salvation. May every part of our character and our conduct make a serious and amiable impression upon others and urge and impel them to ask the way to the master. Let no incident of life, pleasing or painful, injure the prosperity of our souls, but rather increase it. Oh, Lord, send us your help, for your appointments are not meant to make us independent of you, and the best means will be vain without super-added blessings from you. And so we ask grace for those who are suffering physical ailments and diseases, that you might be their physician and their comfort. Be with our president, those in authority who are suffering from this coronavirus, as well as each and every ordinary, everyday person across our country and this world. We ask for mercy for those who struggle with habits and sin, with conflict, with disappointments and discouragements, that you might show yourself strong on their behalf. Be the God who is near. We ask that you would be near to Jean DeVos's family as they go through this time of loss. May they know your comfort and your peace and your presence. We ask for boldness as we would share the gospel with those we know and that your spirit might be awakening people to their spiritual need for you. Add to your church here where we live. We pray for those who are in authority over us that you might give them godly counsel and wisdom so that as a nation we might return to the paths of righteousness. Give the righteous courage, endurance, and strength. And continue your good work among our teachers and staff and students here at Open Bible Christian Academy and bring the lost to a place of repentance and your people to a place of maturity and added faith. Pray for Dan and Heidi as they minister in difficult circumstances. We pray for reconciliation between Bang and the community. And we ask for a favor with the chairman The Pure Church at Happy House might continue to meet. Pray for Hannah and Melly as they have Bible study with Filipino young ladies and point them to Christ. We ask for your grace to be poured out on the Colonia Taramara through the work of Lightshine and El Alfarero. Oh Lord, because you care for children and their families, we do as well. And what a joy to be a part of your ministry there. We pray as well for your church that suffers persecution this morning, as it does every morning in various parts of our world. Pray especially this morning for those in uh, Tajikistan and for pastors there who are interviewed by those in power because they have shared your gospel. Give them your strength, we ask. 
And now, out of the abundance of your goodness to us, we would honor you by obediently bringing to you our tithes and love offerings. We'd ask that you'd use us as a church family to further your cause and your kingdom in this world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Certainly we would be in no other place than in the Father's love. Um, Charles Spurgeon, in another comment, uh, one of his commentaries on the Psalms from one of his sermons, uh, would say about prayer that prayer for, for a Christian ought to gush forth like rushing waters. And we see this in verse 4 of the passage we'll read together in just a moment from Psalm 109. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. And we should picture Christ being falsely accused, because these words are his words. Um, but he would give himself to prayer, and he demonstrated that for us again and again. Think on that when we get to that verse as we read Psalm 109. Help me, O Lord my God. Please stand together. <clears throat> Be not silent, O God of my praise. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Man, 
When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Psalm 109. Please be seated. Good morning, church family, both those that are here and those that are watching online. Good morning. This morning, we are heading back to Exodus. We're looking at the fourth plague. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 20 to 32 this morning. As you turn there and get situated, uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for His Word for us this morning. Father, we praise You and thank You for who You are and all that You have done for us. Lord, You are abundantly good and kind. Lord, we really do want more and more of You. We want to be changed by you, by your word, and by your gospel. So speak to us this morning. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds uh, to hear your word and to receive it as joyful servants of you, as your children, hungry, ready for you to work, ready for you to move in our hearts and in our lives and all over our world. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Up to this point in the book of Exodus, it's become clear that God and Pharaoh are at war over who has power, who has authority over the people of Israel. This war, though, extends beyond just the Jewish people. It's who rules, who reigns over all things, over the Egyptians, over the land of Egypt, over the laws of nature, over everything and everyone. Moses and Aaron correctly understand and know who is right. They know who will ultimately win this war and this battle. And that truth has allowed them to walk by faith, to act boldly, to act courageously over the last three plagues. Further, as we saw two weeks ago, now Pharaoh's magicians also know and understand who is going to win this battle. They recognized that the plagues that God was bringing, uh, they recognized that they couldn't copy these plagues. They couldn't reverse them, and so they admitted that this was the finger of God at work in their world. Despite this, Pharaoh still hasn't come around. He is still hard-hearted. He is fighting, resisting, digging his fields in, refusing to let the Israelites go, even if it's to worship another God more powerful than he is. The plagues are wreaking havoc all over Egypt. It's wreaking havoc on the economy and daily life. But Pharaoh is unchanged. So far, we've seen the Nile River turn to blood. We've seen infestations of both frogs and gnats. Each one of these plagues has attacked the Egyptian gods and Pharaoh himself. God is continually zeroing in on Pharaoh's heart. God is giving Pharaoh opportunity after opportunity, chance after chance to recognize that the Lord The God of Israel is the king over all the earth. Pharaoh, by now, should recognize that he is powerless. That the God of Israel will accomplish his plans and his purposes in his world. That the Lord will be victorious and receive all the glory, honor, and praise and worship of his people. That he should turn in repentance and faith so that he could experience grace, mercy, and forgiveness and the salvation of this God just like Israel would. But he has not. He cannot. He will not come to that place. Instead, he is stubbornly holding on. He remains unmoved and unchanged by all the things that are so obvious. He is trying to control every situation to accomplish his own plans, his own purposes in the world, without giving in to God's demands. Now, this didn't, hasn't, won't catch God by surprise. Instead, everything is happening just as the Lord had said. 
God is continuing to work. He's continuing to move. He's continuing to reveal His glory, His salvation, His power, His ability to save, and so much more to the Egyptians, to the Israelites, and to you and I. This morning, we're going to look at God's fourth attack, the fourth plague. This one is the plague of the flies. I think as we read and as we study this morning's passage, we will hear God say to us, I will not share my glory with another. Instead, I am creating a separate and distinct people to worship me. With that in mind, let's turn our hearts and turn our attention towards God's word for us this morning. Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 to 32. This is God's word for us today. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water. And say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you do not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there that you may know I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to the Lord your God within the land. But Moses said, it would not be right for us to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as He tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go. Sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead to the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. That is God's word for us this morning. Flies are annoying and frustrating, aren't they? We even saw that this week with the vice president debate. That was most of the talk afterwards was about the fly on Pence's head. It doesn't even have to be the biting flies that make us miserable, does it? Two weeks ago now, we had Hope's birthday party at the house. With all the little ones running in and outside, uh, the door was left open most of the afternoon. As you can imagine, with the food inside and people coming and going, flies ended up in our house. It wasn't a terrible number, maybe five, maybe ten, just a handful. But still, two weeks later, we're still trying to get rid of the flies in our house. They are driving us crazy with their buzzing, their landing, they're crawling on us, they're landing in our food, uh, and it's only a few flies. But the closest thing I've ever been to the biblical plague of the flies was one of our trips to Mexico. We took the Lightshine kids camping near this apple orchard. As soon as we got there, as soon as we got off the vans, uh, we realized that there was a whole lot of flies in this area. At first, they didn't bother us too much. They weren't landing on us. They weren't biting on us. They were just kind of buzzing, flying around. But as the trip went on, especially in the food cabin, as we cooked and as we ate our meals, the flies just overwhelmed us. Carrie tells the story of her and Heather Nickerson getting ready for bed one night. The cabin was mostly dark. They thought all the flies had kind of settled down or left for the evening until Carrie pulls back the covers of the bed 
Then, all of a sudden, the room was filled with this swarm of flies that had previously been unseen and unnoticed because they were covering the entire bed. Needless to say, Carrie and Heather did not sleep very well that night. Carrie, still to this day, can't see a fly without mentioning that trip. I'm pretty sure if you asked her, she honestly believes that she lived through the biblical plague that we see in this passage. Flies are ugly, repulsive creatures with disgusting habits. One fly is a distraction. Ten flies are a nuisance. Fifty flies are maddening. So imagine an entire plague of them. Imagine being so overwhelmed by flies that they cover every surface, infiltrate every building and every room of every building. You can't escape the constant buzzing because there are so many of them. Further, there is absolutely nothing that you could do to keep them off you, to keep them off your food. They're literally everywhere. That's what we're talking about in this fourth plague. But let's take a closer look at these verses. Let's take a closer look at these plagues. First thing I think we see is the same pattern. New plague and a clear distinction. We see that in verses 20 to 24. Allow me to read those verses for you again. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water. And say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you do not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies may be there, that you may know I am the Lord in the midst of all the earth. I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. If you remember back two weeks ago, we talked about the cycle or the pattern of the ten plagues. There are three cycles of three plagues each, all which lead us, point us to the tenth and the final plague. This is the fourth plague. So our pattern, our cycle, starts over. So just like the first plague was introduced, Moses is commanded to go out and meet Pharaoh early in the morning by the water. Then he there demands with the Lord's authority, that Pharaoh let the Israelites go. And he warns them, if he doesn't let the people go, that God promises he will send a plague. In this case, it's the plague of the flies, if Pharaoh doesn't listen and doesn't obey. The pattern is exactly the same. But this time it's with a new plague. The end of verse 20 reminds us of what it's at stake. It's not just about slaves being set free. The issue is much bigger, much deeper, much more important than that. It says, let my people go that they may serve me. The primary issue is who these people are going to serve. Is it going to be God or is it going to be Pharaoh? Who has authority? Who has power and dominion over them? Really, the question is, who are they going to worship? And what that worship looks like. I love the way Brian Estelle states what the Exodus is all about. He says, the goal of liberation from bondage to this tyrant is rest, which is expressed in worship. We can't lose sight of this fact. This is why the Exodus is so important. This is why God and Pharaoh are at war over the people of Israel. It's not just about where the people of Israel live or what their life is like, but it's more important than that. It's all about who they worship and who they will serve. Therefore, God cannot, He will not settle for anything less than a complete and total exodus. God's next attack is in the form of flies. God's threat to Pharaoh about the coming flies is in verse 21. And it's actually a play on words. The idea is if, God, if Pharaoh didn't send out the people of Israel, God would send out flies on Pharaoh. He would send them out to be on Pharaoh, on Pharaoh's servants, on the Egyptians, and in Pharaoh's very house. The image in the picture is that they would be everywhere. 
the flies would be like a heavy burden, a heavy blanket on top of Egypt. Their houses would be filled with flies. Further, they would cover the ground so that they couldn't even take a step without crunching flies. Once again, we don't know exactly what kind of fly this plague is talking about. In fact, most scholars, because of the Hebrew words, believe it's many different kinds of flies swarming together at one time, making up this biblical plague. However, the psalmist hints that these flies weren't your normal house fly that just kind of buzz around and annoy you. Rather, these are probably more likely the biting kind of flies. Psalm 78, verse 45 says, He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. So it looks like this isn't just a frustration, an annoyance at the vast number of flies, but it looks like these flies are biting and attacking the people of Egypt, without any hope of relief. While not life-threatening, this plague would obviously take an immense toll on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. God isn't overwhelming them with great things, but instead he's using very, very little things in great quantities. This plague, just like the gnats before it, is a testimony to the power of the Lord who can take and use even the most small thing, the most everyday thing, to accomplish His purposes and to bring about His judgment, to display His glory and His superiority over the gods of Egypt. Once again, the God of Egypt who the Lord is targeting in this plague isn't 100% clear. There's lots of options, actually. But it seems most likely, at least in part, this one is directed at Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, who many Egyptians viewed as their protector and as their guardian. This plague, though, makes it clear that the God of the Israelites, not Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, is in control over the flies. Beelzebub was powerless to control the flies, to hold them back, to keep them away. He couldn't guard and protect Egypt. Instead, the flies are the actual thing that ruins Egypt. Clearly, the Lord God of Israel is the Lord of the flies and over all creation. But once again, it's clear. It's following the same pattern, just with a new plague. While there is much the same with this new plague, there is one thing that is new. One thing that we haven't seen before. That is the clear distinction between Israel and the Egyptians. Verses 22 and 23 make it clear that the flies will not fly in the land of Goshen and bother the Israelites. God is making a division, a distinction between His people and Pharaoh's people. Think about that for a moment. Egypt was totally swarmed, totally covered, attacked by flies. But the Israelites' homes, their land, their region is a no-fly zone. There's a clear boundary. This line flies are allowed to attack. This line over here, there's no flies. How noticeable, how obvious would that be? That's exactly the point. Everyone would see the clear distinction. It would prove that the Israelites were God's people and that He was the Lord in the midst of the earth. Pharaoh, all of Egypt, would see clearly that the Israelites were God's covenant people, that He was rescuing, saving, redeeming them. That he was the one powerfully protecting his people. That he was sovereign and powerful over all things, even the flight of flies. He was the one who was working, moving for his own glory and for his people's good. He was the one who was bringing judgment and wrath and condemnation against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Ross Blackburn says, The division between Israel and Egypt declares simultaneously that Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods cannot protect their people or their land, while the continued welfare of Israel in the midst of disaster declares the Lord can do both. God was making this unmistakable, undeniable, by highlighting who His peoples were and whose Pharaoh's people were. God is using the same pattern with a new plague of flies. And He's making a clear distinction to reinforce His message to Pharaoh. But will it work? 
will this time be any different from the first three times? If you're anything like Moses, you kind of have some doubts about that. And that's where the rest of our passage this morning leads us. There we see negotiations, pleading, but the same result. Verses 25 to 32. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to the Lord your God within the land. But Moses said it would not be right to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as He tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead to the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart, this time also. And he did not let the people go. In the last section that we just looked at, there was lots of same, but with a new plague. In this section, we see a whole lot that's new, but the same result. The very first thing that we see that's new in this section is negotiations. Through the first three plagues, Pharaoh's response has always been to call in his magicians and have them try to replicate, duplicate, what Moses and Aaron were doing. The last plague, the magicians weren't able to do that. They told Pharaoh that this is the finger of God. And so, this time, Pharaoh skips that step seems like he has probably dealt with this plague long enough. He's tired. He's frustrated. He grows weary of it. But he doesn't call his magicians. Instead, he calls Moses and Aaron. It appears that Pharaoh has learned his lesson, that the Egyptian gods are powerless against the gods of Israel. The only people who could fix his problem were Moses and Aaron and their God. So he tells them, go sacrifice to your God within the land. At first, this seems like a win. It seems like Pharaoh is coming around. It seems like that he's willing to submit to the Lord. But that's not what's happening. Look closer. He says, go sacrifice to your God within the land. Pharaoh isn't making any major concessions. He's a shrewd negotiator. He's making a power play here. He's trying to solve his problem without really giving up or risking anything. His thought is, give the Israelites a few days off to worship. They will appease their God. Then life will get back to normal. There will be no more plagues. Might not be exactly what he wanted, but it's a solution to his problem. And one that's very low cost. No risk for Pharaoh. Most people, especially slaves, would jump at this deal. But look closer. Pharaoh wants them to worship in the land. He wanted to keep his slaves under his control, even when they were worshiping their own God. Obviously, this isn't at all what God wants or God requires. These are his people, not Pharaoh's. He wants their complete worship, complete service. He will not share them with Pharaoh or anyone else. Further, Moses and Aaron recognize this for what it is. They realize that accepting this deal while leaving them some short-term success would still leave them in slavery and in bondage. It would not produce a complete and a total salvation, redemption that God promised. It would make them only partially obedient to God, which we know, just like they knew, would be the same as disobedient. Therefore, Moses tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh, this isn't going to work. Moses then explains that the sacrifices that they would be offering to their God would be an abomination to the Egyptians and result in the Egyptians getting angry, upset, frustrated, and violent and probably killing the Israelites. So they really do need to leave the land of Egypt. What Moses is saying here is, Pharaoh, we will sacrifice bulls, sheep, goats to our God. 
the Egyptians worship those things. So they're not going to take real kindly to that. Worse, it's going to look like we're sacrificing the Egyptian gods to our God. To help modernize this, to help us get a flavor for what's at stake here. This would be like sacrificing a pig in a Jewish synagogue. Having a pig roast at a Muslim mosque. Or setting up a burger shop right in front of a Hindu temple. Obviously, none of that would go over very well. It would cause lots of problems. Probably riots and violence. Some have doubted Moses here and assume that he's just making excuses. He's trying to get away with a little bit. But history tells us that this was a legitimate concern. And it really did happen. Much later, in the 5th century, uh, there was a Jewish settlement in the Upper Nile area of Egypt that was massacred for this very thing of offering sacrifices to their God. Further, as we've already seen, this ultimately is an obedience issue. Israel must worship God the way God instructs them to worship. Pharaoh needs to know. He needs to understand that truth and that reality. So Moses kind of tacks that on at the end as a subtle but strong reminder of whose people Israel really is and who really has authority and power to demand from them what he wants. Pharaoh seemingly understands where Moses is coming from. He agrees with his assessment at least about where these sacrifices should take place. Because he continues the negotiation, but this time he gives up the idea that Israel must worship in Egypt. He just says, just don't go too far away. Obviously, the idea, the implication is that he can keep an eye on them and he can bring them back when time's up. Pharaoh ends his part of the negotiations with a request for Moses to plead for him. That's really interesting, isn't it? Pharaoh knows that he needed Moses and Aaron to plead his case, to talk to their God for the flies to be removed. Further, he wants Moses to pray for him. This is personal. It's not just pray for Egypt, pray for my people, pray for my land, pray that my discomfort, but it's personal. Pray for me. God has impacted, affected, humiliated Pharaoh. Pharaoh knows he needs God's help. He has to be desperate to reach this point. So between the negotiations and the way that they took place, between Moses begging and, or Pharaoh begging and pleading Moses to plead for him, it seems like Pharaoh learned his lesson. It seems like he's ready to submit to God. But Moses isn't quite so sure about that. He tells Pharaoh that he's going to leave, that he would plead his case for the Lord to remove the flies. He will ask that God take away the flies tomorrow. Again, proving that the Lord was at work in this situation and it wasn't happenstance. But he tells Pharaoh not to cheat, not to go back on his word, not to change his mind and not let the people of Israel go. If you remember, after the second plague of the frogs, Pharaoh promised to let the Israelites go. But as soon as the frogs died, he changed his mind. He went back on his word. That wasn't lost on Moses. That wasn't lost on Israel. So Moses reminds Pharaoh of that here. Pharaoh is not going to get away with any of his broken promises. Moses sees it. And more importantly, God sees it. So we have negotiations which lead Pharaoh pleading for mercy. But our final verses show the same result. Moses does exactly what he told Pharaoh he would do. God listens to Moses' prayer and he removes all the flies. All of them. Exactly when and exactly like Moses asked for. But Pharaoh doesn't follow through on his end of the deal. He doesn't do what he said he was going to do. He does exactly what Moses warned him not to do. He hardens his heart once again. He still would not let the Israelites go. He still won't submit to and obey the Lord. How foolish is this? He knows he is losing. He knows he is powerless to do anything about the flies or any of the rest of the plagues. He has lost the negotiations. He was humiliated at the point of asking Moses, one of his slaves, to plead to his God for him. He knows the Lord has to be the one to remove the flies. 
But the second that there's any relief, the second God lets up, lets his foot off the gas, the second Moses is out of sight, he goes back to being stubborn, hard-hearted, and rebellious. Clearly, the God of Israel has more work to do. Pharaoh has learned something of who God is, but not enough to convince him or to force him to change his ways. Israel still isn't free to worship their God. But so what? What does this passage have to do with me and my life? I'm not being attacked by flies. I'm not suffering under slavery. What am I supposed to learn? What am I supposed to do with this passage? Let me give you three things that I think this passage is calling, causing us to think about and to begin doing in our lives this week. The first one, God's distinct people. As we saw in this passage, in this plague account, there was a clear, unmistakable distinction between the people of Israel and the people of Egypt. God's people and Pharaoh's people. The land of Egypt and the land of Goshen. Obviously, this was a bigger difference than just the pest control company that they chose. God was making it clear who his people were. Now, it's really easy for us to fall into the trap and to think that God saved Israel and he kept them from suffering from the plagues because they were more righteous, they were better, they were holier than the Egyptians. But when we looked closer, we saw that wasn't God's reason. Instead, the distinction was all about God's grace. It was all God's choice. The distinction was meant to reveal the character and the nature of God to both Israel and to the Egyptians, to Pharaoh and to us today. God protected. He would eventually save Israel to demonstrate His grace, His sovereign rule, His saving power over all. Therefore, He chose to set Israel apart. He made His people distinct. The amazing thing is, God still does this. He still makes a distinction between His people and the world. Fortunately for us, He does this in a much better, much greater, much more important way than keeping the flies away from us. Now He does it through the cross. The cross of Christ divides those who are God's people from those who are not. This doesn't mean that Christians will never experience anything bad. It doesn't mean that God will keep every bug away from us and keep them from bugging us. No. It doesn't mean that we won't suffer. The rest of Israel's history, the rest of church history, proves that to us over and over again. No, God's people do suffer at times. Instead, those who are God's people receive spiritual blessings. They receive the blessings of faith, repentance, the Holy Spirit filling and indwelling and changing them. They receive justification. They're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. They get communion and fellowship with Jesus. They get sanctification day by day. They're being molded and, and shaped and changed into the image of God. God uses them to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He gives them the hope and the promise of eternal life. Those are the blessings we get. Those are the distinctive character traits we get as God's people. Those who don't believe, who don't trust in Christ, they don't receive any of those blessings. Instead of receiving God's salvation, they will receive His judgment. And that judgment is far worse than a plague of flies. What this means is we must put our faith and trust in Christ alone for our standing and for our salvation. This is the dividing line. This is what marks us as God's distinctive people. This week, receive the joys, the blessings, the privileges of being one of God's people. Learn to live in light of whose you are. Live under the blessing of being under the rule and the authority of the King of Kings rather than under the curse and the consequence of living in your sin. Number two, the second thing, wholehearted worship and service. One of the great distinctive blessings that we get as being one of God's people is we get the privilege of rest. And as we learned, rest always expresses itself in worship. But sin and Satan haven't changed in the thousands of years since Moses, since Pharaoh, since Egypt. They are still trying to negotiate, to make deals with God's people about how they should worship God. Sin and Satan are still trying to get God's people to compromise and to remain stuck in the slavery and the bondage of their sin. We are constantly bombarded with offers to settle 
for partial worship, for partial service to God, instead of a complete salvation. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, God's demand is not that His people should have some little liberty, little rest in their sin. No, but that they should go right out of Egypt. Christ did not come into the world merely to make our sin more tolerable, but to deliver us right away from it. He did not come to make hell less hot, or sin less damnable, or our lust less mighty, but to put all these things far away from His people and to work out a full and complete deliverance. Christ does not come to make His people less sinful, but to make them leave off sin altogether. Not to make them less miserable, but to put their miseries right away and to give them joy and peace in believing in Him. The deliverance must be complete, or else there shall be no deliverance at all. Every day, we are offered partial obedience without full commitment. We are offered worship without leaving our sin behind. We are offered a temporary vacation at the cost of eternal rest. This could not, would not work for Israel. It cannot and will not work for God's people today. We must not compromise. We must not negotiate. We must not settle for anything less than what God demands and what God requires. We must leave our sin behind. We must worship and serve God wholeheartedly in the manner that He commands. Partial obedience, compromise, will reveal that we're not members of God's distinct people. Worse, it will leave us in slavery and the bondage of our sin. And it will leave us experiencing all the judgments and all of God's wrath that come with that. Third and final thing, pray and plead for the wicked. I'm always amazed when I read verses like this, where Moses is praying and pleading for Pharaoh. Or when later in the Old Testament, when the prophets are pleading on behalf of another wicked king. I'm amazed that God's people do this, but I'm even more amazed that God listens and He answers these prayers. I think this is a great and an important reminder for us as God's people. We should be praying. We should be pleading to the Lord on behalf of the wicked. If we as God's people aren't doing this, who is going to do it? We, like Moses, should pray that the Lord will spare them from His judgments and wrath. We should pray that their hard hearts will be softened and changed. We should pray that they will come to know and submit to God's rule, and to God's authority over their lives. We should pray that they hear and receive the offer of God's grace and mercy and salvation. We should be praying that the judgments and the consequences of their wickedness here in this life will lead them to repentance and lead them to joining the people of God. By God's grace, He will hear our prayers and He will use them to accomplish His plans, to reveal His glory, just like he did because of Moses' prayer for Pharaoh. Let's pray. Father, you are great in strength and power. You can use even the most common, the smallest thing like flaws to reveal your power, rule, control, and our need for salvation. Lord, forgive us for being stubborn and hard-hearted. Forgive us for settling for half-hearted worship and service to You. Forgive us for remaining in our bondage instead of allowing You to work and move and bring a complete deliverance. Forgive us for not praying for the wicked and their salvation the way that we should. Thank You so much for sending Jesus as our rescuer and our, our redeemer. Thank You for sending the cross which separates us and makes us Yours. Thank You for saving us out of slavery and into worship and into rest. Thank you for all the joys and the countless blessings and privileges that we have from you for being your people. Lord, we pray, we ask that you continue to mold us and shape us into your distinct people. Fill us with an undivided love, worship, and service for you. Make us into a people who begs and pleads for the wicked and for the lost that are all around us. In Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I think if the Israelites in Egypt could sing a song in the midst of all these plagues, it would be the one we closed with this morning.
Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Isn't it wonderful to know even in the midst of the viruses that are going on around us, the sicknesses that's going on around us, that we have a God who cares for his people. So why don't we stand as we sing together, please. God will take care of you. Made whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of will take care of you through days of toil when heart doth fail God will take care of you when dangers fear your path of sail God will take care of you take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care As you go, receive this promise from our God. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.